As you're coming in, if you haven't introduced yourself yet, go ahead and introduce yourself, throwing your name, your organization, your city up in the chat. We've got people from all over the country, uh, so it'll be nice just to see. And then give us an answer to the poll, how you currently feel about data and where are you strongest with it? Good morning, Zach. All right. Mostly audio only, no problem. Hey, Shakina. Just to give you an update, Excited is still leading in this poll about how you currently feel about data. A close second is hopeful, spelled incorrectly on my account. I will take responsibility for that spelling error. Um, and then trailing at the end in equal parts is overwhelm, frustration, and sadness. But they're lagging, but they're there. All right, hey, Laura. All right, and strongest with data on our team today, we have program management coming in first. All right, followed by funder reports, kind of a necessary piece of that game. Uh, hello, Laura, other Laura. We've got multiple Lauras here. Thanks for joining. Um, then we've got tied for last there, impact assessment and program evaluation. Oh, but things are moving up. Yes, I'm going to be a radio announcer for horse races or Zoom polls in the future. I mean, Ariana, you have the best podcast voice ever. <laughs> We'll just do, um, you know, I don't even talk about anything, but we will today. <laughs> All right, folks are coming in. Hey, Norma. Yes, hello. Welcome, welcome. All right, let me see where we're at. Because I want to be respectful of folks' time while letting people kind of come in. Hey, John. All right, let's see. Go ahead and shout out in the in the chat if you are ready to see the the results of this poll. Where are folks at that are on this call? Yes, I heard that typing, Kala. <laughs> no, I aggressively type so everyone knows. I love aggressive typing. It is entertaining for me. Okay, awesome. So let me end this poll and share it. Hi, Chad. All right, end poll and share. Okay, can y'all see this? Yep. Excellent. All right, so we have excited, we've got hopeful in clear seconds, followed by some overwhelmed frustration and sadness. Those are options, because I know that's part of the experience at times, for sure. Um, and where are you strongest? It looks like program management, awesome. Followed by program eval, and then funder reports and impact assessment. Cool. This just gives us a good idea. It gives me a good idea and the presenters a good idea for where people are at coming into this conversation and thinking about data and thinking about how you use it um, and kind of why, why you even use it. Um, so that's great. So I appreciate you sharing. All right. So I am going to stop sharing this. Oop. Let's move all of this out of my way. All right. So <laughs> Today, this afternoon on the East Coast, this morning on the West Coast, we've got more results coming in. Um, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to spend the next hour and a half together. So I'm going to do an intro to Group Trail and Director's Cut, which is this event you're at today. Then we are going to hear from Paola Capellan at CUNY and DOE's College Bridge for All program. Then we'll hear from Lisa Lofaso at Friends of Wheels. And then Shakina Taylor Wright, bringing it all together from iMentor. After each presenter, we'll have a Q&A. So you'll get a, a, an opportunity to really ask them some questions about how they are doing what they're doing, how they're thinking about it, and anything that kind of feels like, you know, pressing or interesting to you. So that's the bulk of the day, is hearing from the three of them who are amazing. Uh, just so that you know, for Q&A, we're going to ask you to submit your questions in the chat after each 
um, after each presentation. And then I just want you to note that the session is being recorded and we'll share it with you afterwards. All right, Oop, wrong direction. Here we go. Um, well, before I get here, I'll just say a little bit about who I am because you're hearing my voice. And so I just want to share a little bit about uh, myself. So I have 15 years of experience supporting youth through direct service, program leadership, partnerships and policy and data engagement. And over the past three years, I've worked at Group Trail with program leaders one on one to build out their Group Trail databases in ways that allow staff to engage in their data daily and for them to use student information to create more timely and meaningful activities. And I love what I do and who I work with. And I'm really glad to, for you all to be here today with us. Now, let me tell you, for those who are less familiar, because we have a range of people on this call today, um, I want to do a little introduction to Group Trail, just in case that's helpful. So Group Trail's mission is to empower groups that are making a difference to have an equity impact. That's really important to us. And that's we, we do our work as, you know, as a company with our eye towards that. In Group Trail itself, our platform is a hub for goal tracking. Whether you're ensuring that students are successful in the college process, you're leading work-based learning or job placement programming, or even if you're tracking individualized social emotional goals, you can track all of your work in one secure and easy to use platform. So we've been around for 17 years uh, and we provide a platform for many industries um, from manufacturing to casting to insurance, but we have a real uh, passion and focus on, on nonprofits, education and higher ed and the work that you all are doing. So today's session, we're calling it Director's Cut. This is the first one and we are starting a series uh, to bring together all professionals working in particular niches within nonprofits, education and higher ed. Because over the past three years in working with Group Trail, I've been able to work with a lot of organizations to help them set up their Group Trail site and evolve it as their programs change. And I've been able to share ideas between organizations and learn new ways of using the platform, even from the people, from our customers. So the goal of Director's Cut is to bring together program directors, program leaders, and other interested parties together to share strategies about using your data and our platform to drive program engagement and impact. So on this call, um, we have a range of experiences with data and with Group Trail, but wherever you are, what I hope you gain today is some energy around the important work that you're doing and ideas for how to use the information that you have about your students to create more opportunities for targeted engagement and impact. Today's focus, so I mentioned we'll do a we're going to do a series. Today's focus is specifically around college access transition and completion. And we have organizations using our platform that serve anywhere from as few as 20 to as many as 50,000 students. And so there's a huge range. Um, and so our speakers today, uh, this is, uh, before I get to that, this is a representation of some of the organizations that are specifically doing the college access transition and completion work and using our platform to really track and drive that work. And our presenters today represent some of this range of organizations uh, and the work that is happening. And I'm really excited for them to be here with us. Um, so let's, I'll keep it moving so that we can get to them. All right, and what they're gonna do, they're going to, they're gonna talk us through how they clarify the work for their staff, how they use our tool to communicate with their staff and their remote teams, and how to demonstrate um, and report on impact, both internally and externally. So to give you an idea, uh, let's, I wanna take a second on this slide. Um, the purpose of this, I want to give you an idea of scope and scale for the presentations that we'll be hearing today. So DOE and CUNY's Bridge for All, College Bridge for All program focuses on the transition. It serves 50, it served 50,000 students this past summer. So that's pretty much all of the graduating seniors uh, from the New York City Department of Ed. And they have 235 staff that are working, uh, that are using the platform as well to really connect, uh, to make sure that they're, you know, doing the, focused on the work that they have to do with all those 50,000 students. We will also hear about Friends of Wheels. They do access transition and completion work. I think Lisa's gonna focus more on the completion today, um, but they serve eight, about 800 students and have four full-time and four part-time staff. 
And finally, we'll hear from Shakina. Uh, and they're doing a range from access, transition to completion. Um, and the number of students there is 6,000. And the number of staff is 40. So think about where your program fits in. Uh, I think the other thing that will be interesting for you to, to, to notice as you hear our presenters is that you may hear some really useful stuff from a program that is totally different in scale and scope. So keep your mind open to that, but I just wanted to give you an idea. I know it's helpful to, to understand this piece of it. Okay. All right, now, before we get into it, into it, I am going to do a quick vocab lesson for those of you who either kind of are at an organization that uses group trail, but you're not in it every day, or group trail is totally new to you. We're gonna do some vocab. So the first thing is, the first word that you will probably hear a bunch is workspace. That is a student record, and here is what it looks like. All right, vocab number two, tracker. So this is, the da this is what the dashboard looks like of our platform. And a tracker is just a way to filter your students by any of the information that you have about them. And so you're gonna hear about that. Um, it's a really helpful tool to strategically connect with students. Next we have, wait, going in the wrong direction. All right, there we go. Uh, tag, this is a type of data field. It is a dropdown specifically. Texting, that equals texting. You can text also directly to students from our platform. And then the other thing to note is you're gonna hear um, a lot of reference to Enroll or Enroll NYC, um, where you would think that they would say Group Trail, for example, and what that is, Enroll is our template that has all of the pieces of the college process. Because as I mentioned earlier, you can, our, our platform is customizable and so people create all the fields that they want for whatever program they're using, but we do have a standard template um, for the college process and all of our presenters are using that. And so shorthand is enroll, shorthand for enrolling in college. So it's a nice little name, um, but that's what that is. All right, next. Okay, so first up today is Paula Capellan, the program coordinator for College Bridge for All. So I am going to turn it over. Yay. Um, let me share my screen. Can you stop sharing, Ariella, so I could share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, everyone. So I am known for always having issues with Zoom. So I will ask you if you can see my screen. If you can see my screen. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so wait, let's see. Okay, so as Ariela was saying, my name is Paola Capellan. I am the program coordinator for College Bridge for All. I've been working in the access success field for over seven years. In this call, there's like previous supervisors of mine, co-workers of mine, current co-workers of mine. The field's small and we all know each other. Um, I think that like many BIPOC folks, what drives my connection to this work is knowing that uh, underserved communities are worthy of equitable access to higher education. Um, and also just experiencing through what it means to not have that support at an earlier age and wanting to make it better and give back to my community. And I just truly love the work that I do and the way that we can use data to drive that work. And another thing that you can remember me by is that I have never had a burger. Okay, I've been in the US for over 15 years, never had a burger, will never engage in this behavior. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about College Bridge for All. I've been working at College Bridge for All for over a year and a half now. And College Bridge for All is a partnership program between the City University of New York and the Department of Education. Our goal is to increase college enrollment. And in order to do that, we use a near peer mentorship model. And what that means is that we hire current college students and we train them around the matriculation process. And these students then are able to support the DOE's um, graduating high school senior class, taking them all the way from high school graduation to this year, not only the start of college, uh, but this year we were privileged enough to be able to support students through the first 21 days of their college experience. Our coaches work 15 hours a week. So they're part-time staff. Um, and so hold them, hold them tight with me for a second. 
this year was super interesting because we started with our school-based model. That model ran from April through August and we had 110 schools that opted into our program and we were serving about 14,000 students. Then COVID hit and as a response to COVID, we had the privilege of being able to support the entire graduating class of New York City, which meant that we had a month to go from serving 14,000 students to serving 50,000 students. And so we ended up with about 220 bridge coaches supporting a little over 50,000 students. So we have a lot of staff that works part-time. So full-time, we have a team of four people. So a lot of work, little people. <laughs> so before I jump into telling you what and how we use Enroll, I want to talk a little bit, give an overview of the purpose of Enroll in our program from my perspective. So from my perspective, we use Enroll to inform coach work with student information and also giving them a checklist, like everything that they see in the workspace is also a checklist of the enrollment tasks that their students have to complete. And that also informs our program priorities. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Also to manage. In enroll coaches are able to manage their work by creating trackers and knowing who to target. And we, as a managing staff, are able to see how coaches are doing and progressing in our key data points, but also help them manage their work and their outreach. And the last piece is reporting. Our coaches are able to report to their schools about the work that they're doing with students. We are able to report to our funders and evaluate our program and impact. And that reporting then creates a feedback loop that leads us to inform our programming and coach management for the next year. So I wanna talk a little bit about informing and hold on tight here. So um, in the student workspace, our coaches are able to see everything from where those students have applied to CUNY. We use a lot of our institutional data to provide coaches with a quick snapshot where their students are at. Um, if the student completed their FAFSA, um, what their post-secondary plan was for the summer. But the key thing to note here is that this information is information that we either get from CUNY or from the DOE directly, which means that 80% of the time is correct, maybe like 70% of the time is correct, and then 30% of the time it's not. So we use uh, what we call the Enroll Update Form, which is a Google form that's integrated into Enroll. In that form, coaches share with their students directly. And in that form, students are able to tell them, this is my name, this is my email, my phone number, and this is what I'm actually doing uh, for the summer this year. And so what that does is that it allows our coaches to maximize their 15 hours. We don't want our coaches to spend five hours out of their 15 hours inputting data manually. That is not a good use of their time. This form is sync into enroll. Listen, the magic that happens behind the curtain. All I know is, that students complete the form and every single night that information gets uh, synced into their workspace in Enroll. And that means that whatever the student in, put in that form gets connected to Enroll and the coach can see in this tracker, the completed senior survey tracker, which other students completed the form and also they can click and see what was updated. Um, and that is super helpful because they don't have to do that for themselves then. The other piece is managing. So you will hear me talk a lot about that our coaches work 15 hours because we're super aware that they work 15 hours and that they have cases that this year for the expansion were between you know, 300 students or so. So not totally realistically manageable. And so in order to help them kind of think about their work and organize their work, we try to keep our enroll asks of our coaches super minimal and very consistent. So in Enroll, our coaches have to do two things. They have to update the Big Ten, and I'll talk about what that is in a second, anytime they work with a student on them, and they have to submit what we call our connections tracker. So the Big Ten are key 10, 10 key data points slash um, enrollment steps that we have identified for our coaches to work with our students. Submitting your enrollment deposit, completing your FAFSA, things like that. And so every time they work with a student, they're supposed to update that. We know that will happen on a weekly basis for some students, for others it will not. But the thing that we hold our coaches accountable to do every single week is to outreach to students. Our coaches will love to be able to make students reply to their emails, their texts, but they cannot. And we try to be super clear about that is not in your control. What is in your control is who you outreach to, 
what you outreach about and when you do it. And so in order to increase accountability and help guide that work, we have this tracker that we release every single week. And so in it, our coaches are able to move students from unassigned to either outreach or connected or connected more than once. But we know that they cannot control connections, so we hold them accountable to outreach. So every single week, they're supposed to outreach to every single student they have contact information for. And they do that in this tracker. The other things that you will notice that we do is that our subjects for the trackers are very literal and tend to have a deadline on them because that helps our coaches know, okay, here's a tracker, here's what I need to do, and here's when it's due by. So that when, I, when we follow up, they're not surprised by it. The other thing that I wanna mention is the pin. Let me tell you about this pin. Okay, so here's what the pin does. It brings any tracker to the top of that user's page and it pins it there. And so we trained our coaches to know that any tracker that is pinned is a tracker that is pushed from the central team for you to do something. So this way the coach can separate the, the trackers that we push out that they have to do something with versus the trackers that they create for their own work. So this way they can innovate and create other trackers for still know what we are pushing that they have to do. And again, part-time staff, 15 hours, right? So there's so much information in Enroll. And, and, and when you first meet the platform, it takes a little bit to like figure it out and know how to make a tracker and know how to use all of the information. So we know a lot of the information in Enroll way better than our coaches. And so this year we really try to, how do we actionalize? How do we make this information more actionable? How do we help you, how do we inform your work and help you manage it? And so some of the ways that we did that was, for example, if you look at the MathStar eligible tracker, MathStar is a support program in CUNY. So we have a tag, a field that allows us to know which students are proficient and in what they're proficient. So we were able to push a tracker to our coaches saying, these students might be eligible for MathStar outreach to them by this date. And you can look up Paola's email to know what that email needs to include. And that way the coach knows where to go to get instructions to do the work and that this work is due. It also highlights for them which of their students might be eligible for this service. So that if I'm Ariela and I'm gonna meet with Laura tomorrow, I know that she's eligible for, eligible for Kini Star. I can bring that up with my student when I'm meeting with them virtually. And um, the other thing is accountability. <laughs> I love accountability because I see it as a reciprocal process where I, I ask you to do something, but that doesn't mean that you have to like kill yourself to do it. It also means that I have to provide you with the support that you need to do it. So if we're keeping our asks small and consistent, then I'm asking you to outreach every week because your students deserve that. They deserve to hear from you every week. So how can I make sure that that's happening? This counts tracker, it's the life. It's super helpful because it organized all of our staff members, all of our coaches, and then it was able to tell me which of them outreached to, to students and what percentage of the students they outreached to, connected with, or were unassigned. And we only care about outreach and unassigned. For the students that, the coaches that were consistently outreaching to all other students, it was important for me to really be able to say, Huge shout out to you all for doing the thing you're supposed to do. We see you, we appreciate you. And then it flagged for us, the coaches that had a lot of unassigned, for us to connect with them and figure out, hey, how can we support you more? Do you not know how to use the site? We have uh, office hours and Q and A's, let us help you. Um, are you having issues with your internet? Because like we are remote now and these are students. So it allows us to connect with our coaches to be able to support them do the work. And the last piece is reporting. For um, many of our coaches in the school-based program, they worked more closely with the school. So at the end of their, their summer with us in August, they were able to download from Enroll the report that you see in the screen. So they were able to share with their school a quick snapshot of, hey, this, is, this beautiful image tells you how many students I worked with, what percentage of them ended up where, and where I ended up with some of the key things that I was working with the students with. Um, and from the programmatic perspective, we also use 
um, the connections in the role to talk about our impact and to report to funders. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but Okay, I think I gotta say I have some more time. So I wanna keep going. <laughs> um, thank you. And so this allows our coaches to kind of report back to the schools on where their students ended up. I didn't include this here because I wasn't sure if, was, if I was gonna have time to do it. But a huge like tool that was super helpful this year was texting from enroll. Um, our coaches were able to use trackers where they had all of their students and send text to students. and. They used it anywhere from, hey, I sent you an email to like, here's information for you to do. Um, there's still some tweaks that we want to make to that next year, but that tool was really, really helpful to our coaches to be able to connect with students at a time where probably they were not looking at their emails because everyone was like email exhausted in this virtual world, but maybe it was way easier for a student to look at a text. And the key here being that all of these things were in one space for, for our coaches. So in one space, they were able to text their students, they were able to organize the work for students and update for us um, how they were doing, making progress on the Big Ten Key Database. I think that that's it from me. Thank you, you just gave us so much information. Like, there's so much here. Um, you just told us how your whole program uh, <laughs> gets work done. Um, I love it. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, I want to open it up now for any for questions um, in the chat. So if something is coming up where you're like, hmm, what exactly does that mean? Or how does that work? Or how did you decide how to do X? Go ahead and throw it up in the chat. While we're waiting for that, I do have a question that I want to ask. Um, and that is, Paula, you talked a lot about how about prioritizing the work that your coaches were doing. How did you make those decisions about what to prioritize and when? Yeah, so I would love to say it was everything was carefully calculated. We had a plan to, from the beginning. I mean, no, <laughs> I think we know we knew that we wanted our coaches to outreach to students, and a little bit is kind of like this feedback loop that we talk about. So. Um, if at one point I noticed that actually the accountability tracker, for example, came from the fact that we were asking our coaches to outreach every week, but we noticed that the outreach numbers were not really increasing, even though we had contact information for over 80% of our students. So we rolled out the idea of like an accountability tracker so that we could connect with our coaches on that. And then when it comes to connecting students to support programs or like guiding themes or outreach, that honestly came from the expansion piece because for our smaller program, coaches could connect with their counselor to kind of know what they should be focusing on, whether we're in the expansion, coaches had no previous connection to the students. So we essentially had to think more about how do we help these coaches have meaningful weekly outreach. If I'm asking you to outreach every week, how can I help you make that meaningful for your students? So thinking through, okay, is July, at this point, maybe you should be connecting to a campus resource or checking in on registration for classes and then pushing, pushing out trackers that then coaches can use to reach out to their students with. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have a couple more questions here, so we'll go on to those. Um, are the coaches paid or volunteers? Yes, coaches are paid. They're paid 17 hours a week, 17 hours, $17 an hour, um, and yeah, so there we definitely pay them and it's really important for us that they get paid as well as we possibly can. Nice. And a question from Odette, how was the outreach done during COVID? Yes, it was, um, it was, it was all virtual. So our coaches used different platforms. Um, social media was huge because even though they didn't get a lot of followers, but they could see who was looking at their Insta stories and things like that. They outreach using emails emailing their students weekly because we were able to get a lot of our students' emails from the CUNY application. That's the power that we have working with these two large institutions that we have access to a lot of information. Texting, calling, it was a lot of like, everyone experiences this summer where students just were not that into it. And so you have to get creative. And I wouldn't say aggressive, but committed, very <laughs> committed to getting your students to reply to you. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, we have another question from John. Um, 
is one person responsible for managing the pushing out of trackers among your four full-time staff or is this responsibility shared among your staff yeah so um we we are a small but mighty team and this summer we all kind of do a little bit of all of the things um but with enroll i was mainly leading in enroll and we work with two incredible uh coaches who now are central coaches they're part-time and they kind of took on leadership and ownership of pushing out all of the weekly trackers that we wanted to push out to our coaches thanks um i do have one more question uh, we have a shout out from norma to oh. Papa and your central coaches that's norma we work together <laughs> I love it. Um, my last question is, so your coaches, your staff who are outreaching students, they've got their caseload. What did they find the most useful kind of on um, in enroll for their work? So we did focus groups. So I can tell you exactly what they found. They really loved the themed outreach tracker. So like the CUNY start are your students connected to a resource because they felt that it gave them a focus for their work for that week and then it allowed them to meet the criteria of outreach so not only we're asking you to do something but we want to provide you with as many resources and tools to meet that ask as possible mm -hmm. and texting texting was great but they have some feedback for like how they can access replies versus outgoing text yeah nice Woo. And that was at the end of the summer. How many students, Paula? Um, what, that were in the program or? Yeah. How many techs? How many students? 52,000. Wowza. Yeah, just, okay. a, just a small number. I think Norma's here. She can talk about how many techs went out. It was something like a couple hundred thousand. It was crazy. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. That's a lot of communication. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, yes, if your camera's on, give it up for Paula. Yay. And I, and I see Kate with, and I see little hands. The little oh. clapping hands. I love it. I love it. Small clapping hands. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you guys have really done an amazing job at, um, you know, being really strategic, how to figure out how to really try to connect with all of your students and how to support your, your coach staff. Um, to really reach out and have what they need to do that work. It's not easy this yeah. year. Thank so. you so much. Yeah. Okay. That leads us to our next person up, which is Lisa Lofaso. She is coming to us from Friends of Wheels, and I will let her introduce herself and share what she's been working on. Hi, everyone. Let me get my input up. Okay. So that worked, right? Perfect. You got it. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm Lisa LaFaso. I am the director of post-secondary pathways at Friends of Wheels. Um, I think I'm going on my 11th year in the field, um, which is wild. Um, I've been at uh, Friends of Wheels for a little over a year, but actually started using the Enroll NYC platform at Cypress Hill. So shout out to Cypress. I see some of you here as well. Um, and I kind of came into this work by accident. Um, I was a first gen college student and went through uh, the college application process with a lot of privilege, but it was still the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I didn't realize why until after. Um, and then when I got to grad school, I was placed in a college access program in Boston. And that's where things uh, really clicked for me. Um, and looking at all the resources and supports that I had for my process and how difficult it was even despite that. And if any other student was missing just one of those supports, it's that much harder. Um, so my passion has become making sure that all students have the same access and quality that I had when I was a student because they deserve that. Um, so a little bit about Friends of Wheels. We are a nonprofit working with public high schools, um, right? Well, one high school right now. So Wheels is Washington Heights Expeditionary Learning School. Um, we are a unscreened pre-K through 12 public school. So we're a little bit different there. We are still a small school technically, even though we have all the grades. Um, my role has changed recently so that I'm now working on access and persistence and success, but I'm going to uh, primarily talk about how I use this with our alumni, um, of which there are about, 
I think it's 750 something and we're going to add another 100 seniors this year so that grows every year and as of right now I am the only person supporting alum. Um, so we have we actually just went up to five full time staff in the last week so very excited about that um, and right now we have four uh, part time staff two of whom are MSW interns and two of whom are actually alum working with us right now as well. Um, and we were founded as a fundraising arm for WHEELS. And since then we've grown some robust youth development and college success programming from that. Um, and now we are continuing to expand what we do. So the purpose of Enroll NYC and Group Trail for us, um, Enroll NYC is used as our primary data tracking platform for all of our alumni data. So the alumni director before me had a massive Excel spreadsheet, as I'm sure many of you know, <laughs> um, that tracked all of the things. Um, and then they actually were working with Ariella before I started to get our data integrated and built out into an Enroll NYC platform. So the data that's collected is used in external reports, how many of our students have degrees, how many students do we have at X school, all of that good stuff, as well as internal tracking. Um, so I use it a lot for um, my own work. So I wanted to share three examples of what this looks like. So I'm gonna look at logistical task management. So like really basic things and enroll makes my life so much easier to do. Um, case management, how I actually use it to outreach to students in a targeted way. Um, and then program strategy. So using the information in the database to actually um, inform the strategic decisions I'm making as I'm building out our advisement model. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a near peer model that I'm trying or working on building in the near future. So um, again, I have about 800 alum. Um, and when I started, the principal approached me and said that we have, uh, cause it, we still are, we, um, our first graduating class was 2012. So we have, we're relatively new in that sense. So because it was small and it's continuing to grow, the principal uh, decided he wanted to put up a plaque for every student who obtained a degree. It's a beautiful thing. The hallway has these like little um, printed plaques with the student's name and the institution they graduated from. So he asked me to tell him the new graduates uh, who need plaques. Um, and while this seems like a simple ask, this was incredibly arduous at the beginning because I had no way of cross-referencing who had a plaque and who did not. So my first few weeks of work, I had to go take pictures of the plaques that are on the wall, type that up, and then manually cross-reference that with clearinghouse reports and information that I had in Enroll, which took hours of time and was not a good use of time. <laughs> so what I did is I built a tag into Enroll so you can see on the bottom, um, this whole degree completion um, board is actually brand new because I also realized that I need to track things. I get asked a lot of times how many of our students have gotten their bachelor's within six years, which is the field wide threshold for degree completion, right? Or three years for associates. Um, so I now have indicators for if they achieved that and when their date of their degree was. And I add a simple tag that said plaque. It says yes or needs one or it's blank. So my students who didn't graduate, it's just blank. I don't have to do anything with them. Um, anyone who has a plaque to date, it now says yes. <laughs> so now when I, on the left hand, you can see um, the current institution. He's at, uh, Anthony just graduated from university at Buffalo this spring. So when I get my clearinghouse reports and I update my database into enroll, I can now look briefly at a tracker that tells me who graduated and I can sort for um, who graduated but does not have a plaque. And I can update that to need one. I can then export that report um, of all the students, their like basic information if they need one. And I can get that to my, uh, the school administrator who then puts in the order for me and then I'm done. So it took a, a simple task for, now it's a simple task, but it took a task that previously um, took hours of human power to do something that was like not at all my top priority, but something really important to my principal. He would keep asking me for it. I'm like, oh, I just got to get this done. And now it's a very simple report. So once I put in the upfront work to get it done, now it's all set. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about case management. So now I can um, 
use the platform to directly message my students. So this is a tracker where I sorted my, I filtered my tracker for anyone who's pursuing their associate's degree. I actually did this this fall and I know there's some CACNY folks on here, but when there's the CACNY scholarship, the transfer scholarship, this is what I used this for. So I filtered for my students who are currently in my platform um, pursuing their associate's degree. And um, I came up with these 145 students I clicked this nice field here that said copy email addresses, and I was able to send them an email that, hey, according to my records, you're pursuing your associate's degree. Um, and I was able to select cohorts like 19 and older. So I have this scholarship opportunity. If you're interested in applying, please let me know and I can help you or I can nominate you. So instead of emailing all 800 of my alum, a third or more of which already have their degrees, I was able to um, send a very targeted email to students who would most benefit from that information. Um, I, you can use this for any sort of outreach, right? As long as there's a tag for it or if there's a field in here that has it. So um, other things that I'm thinking of using this for are annual financial aid completion. Um, in our model, we're really looking to target our freshmen and sophomores in college with standardized support. So I have a tracker that, or a field rather, um, a tag that says financial aid completion 2021 or 2021. Um, and it says yes or no. And then I can just filter for that and reach out to students who have that as well, um, who still need their financial aid done. And I am in the process of working with Ariella to set up the text integration as well. Um, Cause I think that will be a huge boost to our case management to be able to send a text to very specific students. Um, when I was doing college visits in a post COVID world I would actually go upstate and visit students on campus. So that's another way that I would use this. I could filter just for students at Syracuse and send them an email that said, hey, I'm going to be at your campus, you know, Friday at 1230, can we go to lunch? And before I had to actually go in manually, look up every school, every alum that's at that school, click onto their workspace, copy their email address, update it if necessary. So it was a lot um, more labor intensive where now it's really, really simple. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about program strategy. So we went to some small tasks, case management, and now the big picture. So I am working, again, I am one person with 800 alum and now new additional responsibilities. So I am working on building out a new advisement model for how we best serve our alumni. Um, and as many of you in this room are not surprised by, I'm looking to do a near peer model. So I want to hire college students to support other college students or folks who are alum and on a different pathway. So for this tracker, I grouped the students by institution. Um, I first did some prep work to see, we send a lot of our students out of city. So I first did um, just like a little geographical audit and mapped out which schools were near each other and kind of clustered them together. Um, and then I went here, I grouped by institution and then I filtered for their matriculation status. So for the purpose of this um, strategy, I wasn't as concerned with folks who had graduated already. So I looked at our students who were enrolled either full or part-time um, and updated that. And then it then grouped the students by the college that they're attending. So I was able to see everyone who's enrolled at a specific institution. Um, and from there, I was able to count the amount of students, first of all, at each individual school. Like here, you could see I have three at Utica, 19 at Lehman, three at St. Rose. Um, and I plugged that into my little homemade chart of each region. And now I can see overall where our students are. And I put that here. So now I have a really quick snapshot of where my students who are currently enrolled in college, where they're attending and what region they are in. Um, I'm thinking of making my near peer model more regional as opposed to SUNY or uh, private. Um, I'm still considering that, but that's what I'm thinking at the moment. So now really quickly, I can see that I have 14 students in the Syracuse area, 22 in the Albany area. If I can only hire two coaches, that might be where I wanna send them out of city to start, right? And then I can build up regions as I get more resources. Same thing for CUNY. I have a lot of students who are still in CUNY. Um, and if I'm thinking of caseloads too, this would let me see what makes sense in terms of caseloads. How, how many staff would I need? what would a reasonable caseload be? Um, and I can use this information in a lot of ways to determine the best strategy for my particular program. 
and I think I just went to hit next and it's not, oh, there we go. Yeah, so that is my piece. So if anyone has questions, let me stop sharing. Thank you, Lisa. Like you are making it your own with all of like the, the really particular things that your program is doing that like, you know, that changes from program to program and then developing out this new program, which I'm really excited about your near fear model for persistence. That's awesome. I can't wait to hear how that is going. I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> Thanks. So I'm going to open it up to questions from anybody. If you've got questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, okay. So there's one here from John. How do you collect these details for your students? I can imagine that there are some, um, that some, if self-reported, can be difficult to keep up to date. That's a really good question. And I've, uh, John and I have actually talked about this offline of how do I best like cross reference clearing house with individual students and stuff. And I'm still figuring out the best way to do that. Um, I do, anytime I meet with a student, I have their workspace up and I'll just update anything that they tell me in the moment. So I met with a student this week, we did his FAFSA. So he's still enrolled. I just put enrolled and I actually have a field in the workspace that says, um when the enrollment was last verified and by what source so mm -hmm. i have a I, in my drop down it says this is a clearinghouse report the student reported directly to a friends and wheel staff the student reported it to a wheels teacher or someone else so i have several like layers so because i'm not ever going to remember mm -hmm. so now i can see okay the student reported this to me a year ago so maybe i need to follow up or this is from a clearinghouse report and some of it is historical enroll data right like I'm only here a year. A lot of the information in enroll was inputted by someone else. And I don't always know how they verified the information or, or the way. So as I'm going through, I'm now just trying to keep that up to date as much as possible. Um, if I do update something from Clearinghouse, I put like, this is from a Clearinghouse report. Cause then if a, my principal asks me for information for the Seaver, I can say like, this is what I have. And this is, you know, how accurate I think it is based on where it came from, but just take that with a grain of salt. And that way kind of, lets folks know where they're coming and, and how much value to put on that source. Does that answer your question? Great. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa, you mentioned the Seaver for those for folks that are not New York. Oh, what is that? Yeah, so uh, DOE principals uh, get this request from Central um, and it is just like enrollment information from the most recent graduating classes. So like type of college they're enrolled, if they're enrolled, like what, what pathway that they're on. Um, and for DOE schools who have a CBO partner, um, we usually end up giving them, uh, helping them fill in the gaps if they're not sure where their students are. Um, and yes, I do use OSIS because for us, all of our students have it. Um, some of my original alum, like my 2012, uh, the other director did try creating their own unique ID. But what I found is that with Clearinghouse, there's no way for them to have that unique ID. So I default to OSIS as much as possible. Um, but there is a field, like you can add your own tag with a different unique identifier. So you could have one for OSIS and you could have one that is unique ID and unique ID could still be OSIS for most kids. And then you could put the ones that you create for the handful that don't have an OSIS. That yeah. would be my guess. So OSIS is the student ID number in the yep. New York City Department of Ed. <laughs> um, that one I can quickly and easily answer. Um, yeah, so the question is about like, um, you've got different data sources out in the world about what is happening with your students. Sometimes it's the student themselves who are sharing information, but sometimes you've got National Student Clearinghouse. Sometimes you have like records in like an old Excel document or a spreadsheet or someplace else. And so the question is like, how can you bring that information in? Because you can, you can import information into the system. You just want to match it on a, on a unique number because students will have the same name, students will have the same birth date. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of different ways to do that too. You can also use the actual uh, workspace number. There's a record there. Every record has a unique ID in our system. And so you can just also use that instead. Okay, any- I learned this the hard way when I had two students with the same name who graduated wheels four years apart and then graduated from the same college four years apart. And I did a whole lot of double takes of like, what? <laughs> and it was true. I had two students who graduated from St. John Fisher, which is very random. And I was like, that's exciting. <laughs> but that's that unique idea. I would have no idea. 
Nice. Yeah. So what's your, so my question, I'm just curious is what, what is your timeline for starting the new program that where you're going to bring on board some, some uh, college students or graduates? As soon as I get the funding clearance from my ED, I'm hoping to put out a job description in January. So, nice. and the hope is that I will onboard anywhere from three to five this spring to do the transition work from spring into the fall. And then going from there, we would kind of build that up in terms of what that will look like. But yeah. I'm hoping to get some version, like foundational version of this set up this spring. Awesome. That's really exciting. Um, love it. Okay, cool. It doesn't look like we have any other questions at the moment. Um, but as things come up, people, you can just also throw them in there um, while folks are talking. Um, and uh, yeah, so that we'll get to it in the Q&A. But let's move on to our next, uh, next presenter from iMentor, Shakina Taylor Wright. Um, go ahead, introduce yourself and take it away. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, like Ariella said, my name is Shakina Taylor Wright. I am the National Director of Advising at iMentor. Um, I've been at iMentor for about two years. Uh, prior to that, I have about a little over 10 years of experience in various forms of college access um, and matriculation work. Um, and I'm really, really passionate about building capacity in adults to really support young people. Um, because as a as a school counselor, those student to counselor ratios are still really unsustainable. And so having more and more adults who can really support students to achieve their highest ambitions is, is super, super important to me. So that is about me. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about um, iMentor and our work specifically with Enroll, which is really, really exciting. Um, so iMentor in general, we are an organization that builds mentoring relationships to really empower first generation students, majority from low income backgrounds to graduate high school, succeed in college and achieve whatever their ambitions are. Um, we are currently working in 22 high schools across four different cities. So we're in New York, uh, we're in Chicago, we're in the Bay Area, and we're also in Baltimore. And we're probably gonna be expanding to even beyond that. Um, we also partner with local nonprofits who implement our model in about 17 additional cities. Um, so lots and lots and lots of, of folks that we're working with and working to support. And our programs either start in ninth grade or 11th grade. Um, our program, so we have program managers who work directly in schools um, and they teach a college prep curriculum about once a week. And then they facilitate an event with the students and their mentors or about once a month. Um, and so a lot of the content in our curriculum was very much college prep focused, right? So really supporting students to, you know, have the knowledge to build their post-secondary list or to complete applications, to prepare for FAFSA and scholarships, to transition to their post-secondary program, either college or gap year or employment. So lots and lots of things that we were really supporting students with, but didn't quite have a way to track that consistently. Um, so that is when we uh, were, in, I was, I introduced, uh, enrolled to iMentor. Um, so this might look familiar to some of my, my CBO folks. So a lot of us know that when you, when you work with, when you're a community-based organization, and you're working directly with schools, you're kind of at the mercy of your schools when it comes to getting access to critical information for the college process. Um, so some of our schools use Naviance um, and some of our program managers had access to Naviance and some of them didn't. Uh, some of our schools used, uh, oh, we developed our, on our own a bespoke college checklist tool um, that really allowed our students and our mentors to enter in application information. So where were they applying? Um, it also tracked things like, did they send a transcript or request recommendation letters? Things that were important, but we actually couldn't control those because those were really school-based tasks. So even though we knew that they were happening, it didn't really, um, like Paola was saying, it didn't really allow people to take an action, um, just knowing it happened. And then of course, uh, like Lisa mentioned, you know, you love those good old Google spreadsheets. So we had lots and lots and lots of people, you know, using Google spreadsheets. And, you know, when you have that, you can't really control how the data looks. It is so easy to delete important things, which gives us all nightmares. Sometimes people have like these color coded where I'm like, can I get a key? I have no idea what that means. So it just got really, really messy. 
Um, and so we wanted to figure out how do we create a system that really is going to work across the variety of schools, the variety of districts that we are really serving and allow us, our program managers, our mentors, our staff to really understand what do our students need and how can we use our program to support those needs. So that is where Enroll comes in. Um, and so for us, you know, we don't directly oversee the college process, right? Like many CBOs who are coming in to add value. Instead, we're more of a distributed advising model, right? So we're all trying to figure out what is the best role for us to play, right? How do we add value with our program managers? How do our mentors really add value to really support that one-on-one -on -one relationship that allows students to get some of these critical tasks done? Um, so our program, again, lots of big size, not as big as Paula's, um, but, but big size, big scale. And so for us, it was like, how can we create actionable priorities, right? So again, similar to what Paula and Lisa talked about with the trackers, um, you know, because we have mentors, we really wanted to be able to give them information on the task that would be most useful for their mentees to complete. So knowing who did or didn't do the college essay, for example, um, allowed a program manager to say, hey, mentor, your student needs this essay. Here's some information on how to support them and allow the mentors to kind of take the lead in that way. It's also super important, as all of you know, to have good ways to streamline communication, right? So how do we make sure that we know what our schools are doing so we're not really double dipping and focusing and, and duplicating those efforts? How does the school know what we're doing so they really understand how we add value, not just as a mentoring organization, but as a mentoring for college success organization, which is really what we are. Um, and so really allowing everyone to kind of know what was happening allowed us to make sure that we're not having students strip through the cracks, which often happens. Um, and then how do we really capture information to better assess our impact so that we can make pivots in real time if needed, right? And, and COVID, of course, showed all of us the need to sort of be flexible and sort of pivot. And so being able to have access to information that you didn't have to wait for or like spend hours like Lisa combing through spreadsheets um, is really, really vital to our program staff being able to make shorter decisions um, a lot quicker. And then also, again, our program is both high school access, transition, and success. So we have a whole different side of our model that's really about supporting students once they graduate. So Enroll for us also had to solve a very real problem of how do we create a seamless handoff between our high school staff and our post-secondary staff, right? Because they have to really understand who hasn't done what. So that way, when the post-secondary staff is taking over, they have a very clear delineation of the things that they wanna make sure they're, they're surfacing and focusing on right away with their students. So that was kind of a little bit about the why we definitely wanted to go with Enroll. Um, so for me, so I am a data nerd, I love data. Um, but I recognize not everybody has that same, um, that same love. And so one of the things that I think a lot about is how do we really increase the data fluency for our staff? Um, oftentimes it, it's really difficult for program staff who are on the ground, who are grinding, who are doing the work every single day to really understand how that work ultimately contributes to our outcomes, ultimately contributes to the success of our students. Um, and so we saw that a lot where, you know, staff were like, okay, I'll track this, but not quite understanding, like, why is it important that I know that a kid hasn't done FAFSA at this moment? So really being able to set um, very strong benchmarks for our programming staff is, is super, super helpful. Because we work across regions, so we're not just in New York City, you know, we're in Baltimore, we're in Chicago, all of those cities have very unique college access landscapes. Um, and they have very unique needs. And so for me, as somebody who has to oversee the college process across, um, I also had to sort of do a little bit of learning myself to kind of understand what are those important benchmarks that are really important for regions to track, right? So in New York City, we know that like, it's really important to know that kids are EOP eligible, for example. Um, in, in California, right, you have to know that kids are eligible for something called A through G, which means if kids aren't eligible for that, they actually can't apply to college in the fall, right? So our program staff were sort of pushing like everyone apply to college in the fall, not really understanding that so many of their kids couldn't, right? And so that really helped 
um, that really, you know, made them, those students sort of feel disengaged with our programming. So instead we can say, hey, we know these are the kids who have to apply to college right now. And for the kids who can't, we're gonna do different programming. We're gonna talk more about pro pathways. We're gonna talk more about gap years, right? So really being able to differentiate their services because we're able to track certain information about students that are unique to each region. So miles, so benchmarks, again, are super individual. And for me, as, as the national director, I, I um, collaborated with all of our regions to really say, well, what's important for your, your region to track? Or what is your school really interested in knowing? So we can really customize. And Enroll makes customization ah, so much simpler and so easy. And so that has been a, a huge game changer because our regions still feel like they can really impact what they want to track as well. It's not just me saying, these are the things that are important, but it's more of a reciprocal collaborative conversation through data. Um, and and like, uh, like Paola, we too have a big 10 um, because again, I would track everything, know that everybody won't. And so instead we say, hey, regardless of your regional benchmarks that we still think are important for you to track, we need to make sure we know these 10 things about every single student, right? Um, because that's gonna be really important for us to be able to compare across, um, which of course our regional and our research and evaluation team spent a lot of time trying to collate different pieces of information, as opposed to really being able to spend time analyzing and understanding what our impact look like. So having these big 10 allows us to have a common language across all of our regions around the big pieces that we, we think are so critical to, to post-secondary process. And then finally, our ultimate goal is all supposed to feed into our ultimate goal, which is to make sure that every single one of our students are graduating from our program with a defined post-secondary plan, right? Whether that's high, whether that's college, two-year, four-year, employment, military, you know, we want to just make sure that our students have a plan and that we are then prepared to support them in that, in that post-secondary uh, success work. And again, like I said, the Big Ten, um, it's really great because again, it, it, it's a unifier. Um, and what's really helpful about it as well is that we can easily run reports for up-to-date information on these particular milestones across schools. So I could look and say, hey, I'm noticing in my Bay Area, they're doing a great job on, on tracking the high school post-secondary aspiration, but something's going on with really understanding if kids have a college list. So maybe now I'm gonna talk to the Bay Area about what do they need so that way they can get this information done. So again, being able to have this language to compare across is super, super important. It also really helps for my development and research evaluation folks um, to be able to share information with your stakeholders, right? So our research and evaluation team, again, like I mentioned, had to spend so much time just cleaning up data. Um, our development team, you know, when those big end of year reports are due and they're sending all those frantic emails trying to be like, what percent of our kids did X or who hasn't done Y, right? That really takes a lot of manpower and a lot of time and energy. So instead of having to kind of frantically uh, try to find this information, we're able to really run these easy reports and people who, and whoever, what information can access it very, very easily. Um, our reports aren't as pretty as Paola's, but again, they, these completion reports are super, super helpful because they provide all of that information in one shot. So we can send these out again to program staff. So our program managers can say, hey, where am I? Am I on track or I'm off track? We can send it to our, um, our regional leads, our development team, our, our research and evaluation team. And again, really understand what is our impact in real time so that if we are sort of not on track to reach that goal, we can definitely respond right away with more programming or different training or different resources so that we're making the data our time, right? Our data allows our program managers to understand how should you be spending your time? And it also allows us to really develop more targeted and better interventions to really support all of the students in our program. I speak fast. Woo, that was it. That was me, okay. Question. Love it. Thank you. Yeah, I like as definitely like all of us in New York, we all speak fast. It is it's a skill. Let's go with the strengths-based view on this. We're good at that. Thank you, Shakina, so much. One of the things that you said, um, you said last that caught my attention too was like the impact on things like training. So being able to see what's happening. So what like I, I'm curious about what's an example of like 
something that you saw in the data that had an impact on the training that you were doing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I actually did a training recently on like, how do you use data to, um, to build your caseload, to focus on your caseload. So it was, it was more of a conversation with program managers because they were feeling so overwhelmed, like so many of us, right? There's so many students, there's so many things they have to do. Um, and so really helping them understand that your data really, if you're using your data correctly, it can actually help you figure out how do you spend your time? Right, because not every student needs a college essay right not every student is applying to a private college, so if you kind of understand the no the value of no is, is also really important in, in group trail. Right, we talk about like you have to track data but like being able to say no a kid doesn't need that no a kid didn't do that can then help you target and focus on the things that kids do have to do. Um, so I think for us at, at iMentor in general, like we use a lot of this information to then track. And then we also try to anticipate based on the time of the year, what's next, right? So in our, in our current, um, our student pages, we have college readiness, we have application admission, and then we have financial aid. And then once we get to the ins and outs of financial aid, right, the next tracking is around FAFSA completion, verification. So really being able to say, if I want you to track a thing, I gotta train you on why it's important, right? And what are those resources? So that way your staff doesn't see that disconnect. They can really understand, wow, this is so, so powerful and it has real ramifications for students. Yes, thank you. Like you go from this one little piece of information, right? That you've like learned to like what the impact of that can have on all the students that you're working with. Thank you for, for figuring that out and sharing it. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions for anybody else. Um, at this point, yeah, any questions that you have kind of for Shakina specifically, um, in general, for any of our other presenters either, go ahead and throw it up in the chat. Um, I'll give a second. All right. Um, while either you have been so thorough that everybody is feeling like, yes, I think there was so much there too. Like I'm super familiar with your, with your programs. And I feel like I just got a masterclass from each of you about how, about how things work. So I really appreciate that. Um, I love it. John said he agrees with a masterclass. I'm assuming. Um, I do have a question here. Oh, uh, Odette is asking, what is EOP eligibility? Anybody can take that one. It's probably New York state based mainly, um, but states, um, some states have uh, local or statewide programs that um, provide access to colleges. Um, so at New York, for instance, they have a program that's um, provided to um, students that meet specific um, income requirements and don't um, gain acceptance through general admissions. And so they have access to this EOP program that will still gain them access to the college. Yes, John, I love it. Thank you for jumping in. <laughs> Appreciate you. Um, okay, we've got another question here uh, from Laura. She says, what's one thing that you've developed or want to develop in Group Trail that um, has shifted or will shift your work? Big question. Yes, go for it. Um, I think for us, definitely thinking about next year is um, allowing coaches to separate incoming techs from outgoing techs so that they're able to better track who responds, particularly when we have such large caseloads. Mm. And continue to build and roll to be a platform where coaches have more information to do their work. So like information about certificate programs, information about career programs, so that it becomes a one-stop shop for them to have like more tools for their work, track their work, and manage their work. Yes, that, that second piece, the training piece, I'm having more and more ideas about how we can use an integration to kind of source like everybody in the city's best knowledge about certificate programs and things like that and keep it updated for everyone. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, any other thoughts, Shakina, Lisa? 
I think for me, it's going to be the texting integration. Um, I think, so I have access to Signal Vine right now, but it's through New York City Outward Bound. So I don't have like the personalization options. So I sent, yes, yeah, Steph, I knew you were going to say that. Texting is everything. Um, but right now, <laughs> like I can just send general text blasts, which is still really um, helpful. But like I've sat in Steph's training on texting um, and like you aspire does a lot of work around this. So like the, that individual piece is something that I know will be really effective and it's going to be a huge value add. So being able to do that and, and have that specificity um, is, I'm really excited about that process. Nice. That's awesome. I think for us, it's sort of understanding like, what is the right questions? What are the right tags? Like we spend a lot of time trying to figure out like, do we need, is this like something we need to know because it's an action? Or is it something that's good to know because it like tells us something about our program? So I think that's a lot of what we're thinking about. And then for our persistence model, it's like, you know, with college persistence, there's so many different things you can track. And so for us, it's like shifting from a task management, like did they do a thing to more of a diagnostic tool, right? Like, so, you know, for persistence milestones, instead of like tracking a bunch of things, we'll say, are they red, yellow, or green? And then, a P and then we'll train our program staff to say, here's the things that green mean. So we don't have to sort of spell it out, but we're able to really use it to diagnose and then create trackers to say, who are our kids that are red? How are we, how are we supporting them? Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of how we're thinking about it too. So moving just from task management to more of a diagnostic uh, piece. Ooh, I love that. Yes. And you can even use fields to help indicate the red, yellow, or green. Okay, this will be fun to talk about. That's very cool. Um, I love it. Well, let me see. It looks like, um, let's see, there's a question from John. Looks like it's for me. Uh, seems programs are increasingly using SurveyMonkey or Google Forms platforms for surveying. Is there anything in the pipeline to integrate these platforms so we can batch some of those? Yes, yes, yes. You can set that up tomorrow. Um, we have the Google Form integration. And so that is a lot of what folks are using. They're using it for everything from like program application. There's one um, after school college access program we work with that that's how all their applications come in. They send students a link to a Google Form and the students fill out the Google Form. And so then all that data comes in overnight and they evaluate each student to see whether they're a good fit and then they move them into a, you know, a cohort. Um, at their program. So you can absolutely do that. DOE um, and, and CUNY's College Bridge for All program, Paolo was talking about this earlier, using a Google form to collect the most updated information from students directly so that you don't have to do all of that, um, all of that data entry. So yes, let's talk. I'll, I'll John, asked, go ahead. John asked another question that I want to answer about how do you orient your staff's comfort and familiarity? Ooh, it is an ongoing struggle. I'll just be very transparent again, because people see some people who have like really bad experiences with data um, or they think like, I just need to report out because you're asking for funder, you know, like, so they're not quite necessarily seeing it as like, if I know this thing, it directly impacts how I should work. Um, so for me, it's a lot of training, a lot of conversations, building in tools. So if I build in like, hey, here's an advising script, I will build in and then track this thing and enroll and update this thing and enroll. So really helping people connect between the actions and the data, I think is super, super helpful. And then of course, like Paula said, it, it is about accountability at the end of the day. And so pre-enroll, right, we would we'd be doing like presentations of like this percent of our kids went here or did X and people would be like, no, no, that number is higher. And then I would say, well, it's not an enroll, so it didn't happen, you know? And so, you know, and our regions get super competitive. So they wanna like make sure they're having the best data. So I think it's really about a combination of things like reinforcing it, you know, as you create resources, like really making sure you're spelling out what you want people to use. Um, and then, you know, sharing back data, you know, in, in, a, in like a timely fashion. So we'll do quarterly step back. So we'll look at pieces of data together and talk about like, what does this mean? What, what else do we need to, to know? But it's, it's a, it can be a struggle. Um, so if you have those folks who love data, lean on them because they can be your champion. So you don't have to do so much of like the forcing, um, but they could be like, this is this changed my life or this was super helpful for me. So that's kind of how I've helped orient my staff, but it is definitely ongoing. I love that. Shakira, you're like, and this changed my life. Yes. <laughs> um, 
sometimes it feels like that um I think another thing we don't manage full-time staff it's more part-time staff but keeping figuring out what are the things that you actually want and staying super consistent with those because it can be overwhelming if it's like I have to update all of these things all of the time and so streamlining streamlining that and simplifying it as much as possible can also be helpful love that and that's and, and I'll say too like I like in, in organizations that I talk to like the the longer that people are working with data the more experienced and things like that it starts that starts to be one of the strategies that I'm seeing a trend in is is really being strategic about prioritizing what it is that needs to be tracked um you know and and what goes into that thought and all of that for sure for sure Cause there's just so much work like you guys do so much work with each individual student it is a lot um yeah and it's different when you're like doing it yourself i see people like look at like all the things that they're tracking and they're like but this is so much and it's like right you're already doing this like people don't realize how much work that they do with each individual student yeah any other thoughts, Lisa, were you about to say something? Yeah, I think, so I don't manage full-time staff, but what I've been going through, like I'm the one inputting the data and pulling my own reports. So like if I don't put case notes in for a student, I'm the one annoyed at myself a month later when I can't remember what I met with the student about. So it's like very clear to me why that part is important. But I think, like I said, I inherited a lot of fields from the outgoing director. And I think part of it, like Shakina and uh, Pella also both spoke about this big 10, it's like, I've had to figure out for myself, like, what is the most important data that I need to be collecting? And like, are there things in here that like, I don't need? Because I'm more likely to do it if it's the things that are really important and that need to be consistent. There's a lot of stuff like, it would be nice to know how many of my students were employed. Do I really need to know that for every single student and invest time? Maybe not, right? It's like a nice to have versus a, a must have. So that's what I've been kind of sitting in is like, how am I figuring out what my priorities actually are? So mm -hmm. that the ones that are priorities are getting done with quality and consistency. Cause that's way more important than tracking every touch point I possibly could with every student. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Lisa. Yeah, and I see like a comment from JR uh, in, you know, in the chat. Yeah, it's like, even if you're the person doing it, managing it, like you're everybody, you're your whole staff, like a hundred percent. Uh, any last thoughts, questions that folks want to share? I'm just going to go back to our slides. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to share my screen in just a second. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, yeah, John said, makes me wonder if some of those less essential pieces can be shifted to surveys and then batched in or done with that sync with the Google sync for sure. Definitely something to think about. And I see Shakina and Lisa both nodding their heads like, yes, figuring out other ways to get that data in that doesn't require, you know, kind of staff doing that data entry. Okay. Um, we have one more question here from Elena. What are the steps for returning students? Uh, Elena, is this returning students? Um, say more about who the returning students are, where are they returning to and from? Oh, to complete their degree. So like someone who stopped out, it sounds like. I think Lisa, you're probably doing the most work with students in that position right now. Yeah, so I have, I, I do track continuous enrollment, um, which is right now just like a continuous or not continuous. Um, I track how long it took them to complete their degree, like whether or not they hit those benchmarks of three years for associates or six years for uh, bachelors. And then I also track transfers. So if I have a student who's not enrolled right now, if they do transfer, like I, I do capture that history of um, what's there. I don't have, there's not the same like access checklist. Like if you're a, a senior in college where it's like, did you apply? Did you do all these things? So like for students that I have that are either transferring or re-enrolling, I don't necessarily track and enroll did they do the common app? Did they do the SUNY app? Did they do this? Because on that scale, like I don't need to report that externally to anyone. It's just like, I'll just put that in my case notes. Like here's what we did today. And I'll like put that in a, in a case note function. Cause I don't need that like in an aggregate form. It's just the individual stuff. Um, so 
yeah, that I think would be what I would say for that. So like I track like if they stopped out where they are now, and then it's more the qualitative case note side um, of what, what that looked like to re-enroll them. Excellent. And then I saw Elena had a question who to contact, who to reach out to. Um, all good questions. I think it depends on what, what your question is. So I wanted to share this. Uh, and wait, shout out if you can see my screen. Hold on. Is somebody giving me a thumbs up? Yes. Okay. I found you again. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, our presenters have been gracious enough not only to present today, uh, but also to share uh, contact information. So if there's something that spoke to you um, from one of any of us uh, or something you'd want to follow up on, here is our info um, and feel free to reach out. I will go to the next thing, but if you need info, if you need me to go back, let me know. Um, and the last, and I want to, there's two more announcements. Can you go back? I'm sorry. Can you go back? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I saved the photo. Thank you. Love it. Excellent. That's exactly what I was thinking. Like screenshot. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. And the last, so I'm, this is my second to um, last thing. Cause I'm gonna let Steph jump on in a second and make an announcement for UA. Um, but our next director's cut event we are going to do one on work-based learning. Um, so the, we have uh, different school districts around the country that are tracking work-based learning experiences for students in our platform. And so really different type of program model, really different student outcomes, different type of student engagement. Uh, so if you are curious, or this is something else that you do as well, and you wanna see what that work looks like. Um, you know, it consists of connecting with business partners to create work-based learning for students. It consists of connecting with students to see what their interests are and where they wanna be engaged, and then tracking that engagement, and then tracking it for equity also within a school system to make sure that students are all getting, you know, equal access to engaging with these type of opportunities. So that will be really great. It'll be a different set of presenters that are really focused and experts in that work. Um, and we'll send out information on when that is coming. So that'll be in the new year. And then Steph, do you want to jump on? You have you, at UA, you have a, um, you've got something coming up. Yeah, so um, we have a data uh, webinar, which I'm really excited about. It's sort of, it really speaks to what you guys talked to today. Um, we make mention of Enroll because we use Enroll and love it, but it's more about what happens in, behind the scenes in terms of like how you can use data to build programming. So I do think it speaks to a lot of the questions that were given today. Um, and so I'm going to link the, let's see if I, um, I'm going to link it here and you guys can sort of read. Um, the there we go um and so you can see a little bit more about what it's about but like i said i mean it's essentially the back end of how you can use data to build programming and refine programming um it's more like beginner level like i'm no data expert at all i just kind of love playing with it and, and whatnot and so we're assuming that people who come are sort of familiar with data but not necessarily like totally love it um, in and out, but hopefully by the end of the webinar, you will love it in and out. Um, so there's that. It does cost 50 bucks, and I know that sucks, but we have to sort of start um, charging for some things like this. This is sort of a new COVID world, unfortunately. Um, so I hope that the 50 bucks won't deter you guys, and please um, spread the word. And we are, of course, um, Norma having a texting webinar too in the next couple of weeks and um, I'll send you guys information on that too. Um, I'll post it here in a second but yeah so on Thursday at two o'clock we have our data webinar and then two weeks after that we have our texting webinar. Thank you Ariella for giving me a moment to talk. Absolutely you do amazing work Steph and your coaches and everybody over there so really glad you could share that and I think it's going to be really great. Um, and you just got a shout out from Lisa that says, I can speak to how great Steph's texting webinars are. So nice. And I see nods too. I think other people have attended them as well. Um, so excellent. That really is kind of brings us to the end here today. I'll stay on for a little bit longer if anybody kind of wants to, wants to ask any other questions of me, I'll be around. Um, but otherwise, Thank you so much. Um, really a pleasure. And uh, yeah, reach out. Thanks, Ariella. Thank you, everyone.